What's up, church? I'll, I'll ask it again because now you're, now you're awake. What's up, church? What's up? It's good to be with you. My name's John, one of the pastors here. Uh, we are in the midst of a series called Who We Are. Turn to your neighbor and say, who are you? Who are you? This, this, is our, this is sort of our vision, who it is that we are longing, aspiring to be, and we're hitting on sort of our core heart. Uh, last week, we talked, we sort of addressed the question, why don't Christians look more like Jesus? Ever wondered that before? Ever been a reason for that before? Let's be a little bit more honest, right? And so we talked about the difference between first chair, real life disciples and sort of intellectual, theoretical believers. If you missed it, I sort of poured my heart out on a platter and I would love for you to check it out. It's a guiding message to the ethos and the heart here at Greenhouse. You can check it out on our YouTube channel or our podcast search, Greenhouse South Florida. You'll find it there. We talked about at the end, one of the calls was that disciples, uh, Jesus said, go and make disciples, baptize and teach. And so we actually had a baptism in one of our micro churches. So we'll throw a little picture up here on the screen. Ian ended up getting baptized, which is awesome. <laughs> Celebrating with him. Ian's parents are amazing. They love Jesus. He said, when I was a little baby, I was baptized. But as an adult now, I was like, you know what? I'm following Jesus now. And so love his parents. I'm sure they are very proud to watch their son going all in, following Jesus. Ian's an incredible disciple, so that was really cool. This week, I want to continue sort of into the next layer of the conversation. As disciples, passionate followers of Jesus, active, dynamic, following Jesus, as we go, I want to hit on one of the key areas where there are lots of areas in our modern world that we are going and have gone, one key area that we are not. And it's important because it's God's heart. So why don't you stand with me as we get ready to read and honor God's word. We'll be in Matthew chapter 24. Miami Heat fans, come on, Jimmy Buckets, goodness gracious. Like, I don't know if there's a more definition of playoff clutch than Jimmy Butler, wow. Florida Panthers fans, and I don't know, I, don't, I heard go Knicks, and that's all right, we'll forgive you. Florida Panthers fans, all three of us that like hockey, we got game seven tonight. I considered wearing my jersey, but I'm wearing it in my heart like Superman. Shh, it's right there. And uh, anyways, I like sports. Do you like sports? I like sports. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, you're my people. All right. I mean, some of you are like, no, I like Jesus. Okay, chill. We're getting there. Goodness gracious. Verse three, as Jesus, here it is, was sitting... On the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and they said, Jesus, tell us, when will this happen? Now, to give a little bit of context, Jesus has just dialogued about how he's about to go. He's about to go away. He's about to go with the Father and the end of the age and these things are going to get crazy and they get a little bit of trepidation in their heart and they say, Jesus, tell us, when's this going to happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered and he says, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ or the Messiah, and they'll deceive many. And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Wow, that could be a whole sermon right there. Jesus is like, things are going to get cray-cray. Don't freak out. I'm giving you a heads up. Everybody take a breath. <sighs> Jesus knows. It's okay. He said, see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Now nation will rise against nation. This looking familiar to anybody right now? And kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes and natural disasters in various places. All these are the beginning of the birth pains. You're like, great, now I'm really excited for what's to come. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. Thanks, Jesus. This is the best sermon ever. I'm so glad. At that time, many will turn away from the faith. They'll betray and hate one another, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow, or the other word is wax, gradually shift from hot to cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And here's where we're going to camp our conversation this morning. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached, what does it say, in the whole world, in the Western Hemisphere, in the Eastern Hemisphere, in pockets, in the, in the whole world, as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Would you join me as we pray? Jesus, help. Amen. 
Turn your neighbor, give him a high five. If you're married to him, you can smooch him. Give him a kiss. Find your seats. You ever miss somebody so badly that all you could think about was getting back to them? Husbands, this was your moment. I just lobbed you a softball. The answer is, of course, yes. You ever miss someone so bad you just, you just wanted to get back in their presence. I remember my wife Nancy and I, we've been married now going on 12 years. I remember in the height, in the midst of the pandemic, we were approaching our 10-year anniversary. How many parents do I have in the room? Any parents here in the room online? Now, there's something about parenting in the pandemic that was uniquely, uh, how would I say this, torturous? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, You love your kids. You're like, man, my kids are amazing. And then there's no school and they're with you all the time. You're like, this is so great. And then you don't have like a moment to breathe or even use the bathroom without them clinging on you. You're like, man, I love my kids so much and I get all of this additional forced fellowship with my kids and this is so good and I'm totally sane right now and it's great right was it just me anybody else parents can I get an amen on that one and and then we had our blessed I feel like this was a gift from heaven Nancy's sister said hey I'll come down and be with the kids so you could go on your 10 year anniversary we're like "Uh, I don't know yes when now yes good She came down and we went to the Keys. And we love our children. Liam is six, Lucia is three. They're so much fun. They're great. But it was a whole lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of nonstop time with them. And it was nice to get away as two adults. And day one, we were there. We went to the Keys because we love the Keys and it's restful and enjoyable and relaxing and the food's awesome and we're there in the Keys and it was great day one. And day two, we're like, man, can you believe like we got a whole night's sleep? Did you remember that was like a thing? That's amazing. I was like, wow, this is so great. And, and, and then day three comes, and on day three, I see my wife furiously swiping through her phone. And it was not social media that she was going through. Can you guess what she was going through? Pictures of our kids. And she's looking, and I was like, oh my gosh, Nancy, are you serious? She's like, but look at this one, little baby Liam. I'm like, oh my gosh, he's so cute. He's so... And we start, and we're three days in from our longing for separation, longing for our kids once again. You ever been there? Maybe not with your kids. You're like, I don't have kids. Amen. You're not married. So, okay, that's good. Uh, maybe not with your kids, but maybe with a person, maybe with a thing, maybe with a place, maybe with a national championship. Come on, Miami Heat fans. Have you ever... Have you ever been there longing for someone or something? We all know what it's like. We were created to long. Now, these earth longings that we find within our frame are not wrong. They're not bad. They're very natural, but they're supposed to be indicators that point us to something eternal. And all this week, I got stuck on this passage as Jesus' disciples, who have been walking with him for several years now, realize that he's about to go. And I'm struck by these disciples asking Jesus when he would return and make things right. Why? Because they love him so much. Jesus isn't even gone yet, and they're already asking when he's coming back. Ever had a friend visit you from far away, and they're still with you, and you're like, okay, this is so good. When are you coming the next time? Like, can, you book, can I get you to book your flight right now? Like, what if we split it 50-50? Like, when, you ever been there before? Like, they loved him so much. They're like, hey, 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 just you talking about going already gets us thinking, when are you coming back? And I realize in our cultural context, this is a conversation that we have almost never. Church, are we longing for his return? Are you longing? Am I longing? And I think if I'm being truly circumspect, the answer is sometimes and maybe. I got a chance to work for a charity foundation and interact with followers of Jesus all around the world and it was a regular part of the conversation when I was over in Africa and it was a regular part of the conversation when I was over in the Middle East where oftentimes things are difficult and persecution is very real but we live so comfortable it's easy to forget that we are not home yet. Home is with him. But these disciples, they had a sense, and the early church was fueled by this idea of Maranatha, come back, Lord Jesus. We love you so much. We know we experience components of you, but we see dimly as in a mirror. But some point, you're going to come back, and we'll get to see you face to face. Do we long for him? Jesus promising 
these disciples then and these disciples now, that he's coming back and we get to go home. Now, no one knows the day, day, no one knows the hour. Jesus makes that clear. Many hypothesize, but no one knows. But chronologically, we're given indicators by Jesus himself as to the things that we are to expect to see as we get closer to his return. He says in verse six, you're gonna hear wars and rumors of wars. Check, right? Don't be alarmed. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Check. Famines and earthquakes in various places. Let's just add in their pencil in there, 29 inches of rain in 24 hours. What in the world? Check, crazy earth stuff's gonna happen. Persecution and death. Hated by all nations. I know in North America, this is not our experience yet, but for our brothers and sisters around the world, the majority of the church is like, check, already happening. We'll see the love of many who once burned bright grow cold. Anybody seen that heartbreaking reality, especially in this pandemic era? Check. And then we come to verse 14, and there's one, we, we've seen almost all of these realities in some way, shape, or form, except one. Verse 14, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then, and then. There's a lot of things I don't have any control over. Wars, rumors of wars. Facebook is a crazy place, but I don't think any of us have that kind of social media clout, right? Earthquakes, famines, I don't have that in me, but there's one thing that we can actually contribute to when it comes to longing for Jesus and his heart expressed, which is the gospel preached to the entire world. Now that is something we can do. If you're taking notes, I've got one big idea, one core thought. I'd love for you to jot it down as a point of reference. Here it is. When it comes to love for Jesus, our rabbi, our teacher, we want to follow his ways and his path. When it comes to longing for him to come back again and make everything right and wipe every tear from their eyes, no more suffering, no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. Isn't it great? There's only one thing left to do, and it's the one thing we can do. There's only one thing left to do, and it's the one thing we can do. The gospel, the good news of Jesus preached to all nations. You said, John, are we sure that one thing hasn't happened yet? I mean, it, we're, we're 2,000 plus years removed from Jesus giving disciples this commission. I mean, how close are we? I'm so glad you asked. You didn't, but I did. That's all right. A little while ago, a couple months ago, actually, we sent a team from Greenhouse to a city in North Africa, and this is an organization we work with that plants churches and the gospel in places where it has not yet been or sometimes has never been in known human history. And so we were there in one of these places, and we went from a, a, a beginning to be reached place with the hope of Jesus and the good news that every single human being matters deeply to God, and he loves every single human and created them with divine dignity and destiny. And so we went from one town to another, and, and we were there, and it was beautiful, and it was amazing. You could see it here, and we're looking out over this little town, and Andrea, who's the missions director in Gainesville, she asked the, the worker, the missionary, she said, man, this is, this is incredible. Um, what, what, they're, they're there, they're sightseeing. It was one of those like experience the culture days. She's like, this is such a beautiful place. Wow, look at this vista. This is great. She said, just out of curiosity, how many followers of Jesus exist in this region? And he said, oh, I'm glad you asked, two. She was like, no, 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 like, how, like, not, like, not like how many churches, like how many followers of Jesus? And he said, yeah. Two, town of 43,000 people, two. He begins to weep as he shares about the state of these two followers of Jesus, how alone they feel, how isolated they feel, how persecuted they are. And the whole nature of the day shifted as the group leaned into the heart of God in praying for this community. The man went on to share very specific ways that the gospel could speak to the brokenness in culture, to the hurt and the pain in society, to the anxiety, to the depression, to the astronomical suicide rate, all of these factors that Jesus and God wants to address. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the World, this has always been the heart of God for every people and every tribe and every nation and every language. This is the heart 
of our God. And as disciples of Jesus who have been given very clear missional mandates, we can't be okay with places like this still existing 2,000 years after Jesus went to the cross to die for the sins of the whole world. What do we do with this? You're like, this is heavy. It'll be hopeful, but it is heavy. It's the heart of God for our world. I I wish I could tell you that this story of that city that I showed you in North Africa is an anomaly and say, hey team, I mean, that's heartbreaking. We still got work to do, but by and large, we're doing great. But but I don't want to lie to you because I'm your pastor and I love you. Let's look at the stats together. Right now, there are over 3 billion people classified as unreached by the gospel, the message of the hope of Jesus. 3 billion people. If you're a math person and you know world population statistics, that's about 40% of the world population alive today that is unreached. Now, that's a loaded fact. That's something worth unpacking together, and we'll get into that. But first, I think we have to define what exactly does unreached mean. Unreached is distinct from saying non-Christian or not a follower of Jesus. It's sort of a unique terminology that basically represents a heartbreaking reality. God's heart is for all people to come to know him and come to experience him. That's his heart. And so for those of us that live here in South Florida or over in Guyana or wherever you're watching online, you probably have friends or family members or coworkers who are not yet followers of Jesus. They're not yet Christians. And we are no better. If anything, we're probably worse. We finally owned it and said, man, I am a mess. I need Jesus. Jesus to fix me because I am a mess, right? And so because we've experienced life in Jesus, we want the people we love to experience the same thing. Uh, God loves people who don't yet know him in South Florida. He loves people in Guyana. He loves people in Iraq, right? But there's a difference. For any of us that have friends or family members or coworkers or neighbors, there is a church within reach where they can go and hear about Jesus, For someone in Iraq or Iran or or for somewhere in the Middle East, for example, what unreached means is there's not even a Christian or a church nearby where they could hear the gospel. You guys differ, you understand the differentiation there? If I were to use an analogy, uh, if you're swimming at the beach and someone is out there and, and they begin to drown, there's people on the shore, they can see them and say, hey, someone's in trouble. And there's a lifeguard that's there and they could go out and throw them a buoy and, and they're in danger, but they are in a point where rescue is very near. That is what it means to, you know, in our context for someone to have access to the gospel. On the other hand, what unreached would look like is you're on a cruise ship and someone falls off the cruise ship in the middle of the night in the middle of the ocean. There's no hope of rescue. There's no rescue in sight. You guys tracking with the difference here. So when I use this statistic, three billion people that are unreached, I'm saying three billion people who do not have access to the gospel at all. There is not a Christian church or a follower of Jesus that in chance at any point in their lifetime, they will not hear the name of Jesus even one time. Three billion people. Obviously, this is heartbreaking for those of us that know Jesus, and maybe you're here and you're like, oh my goodness, like what, what exactly are we talking about? We're not talking about value, followers of Jesus thinking they're better. If anything, we think we're, we're in need of rescue. But for many of us in this room, we have experienced what it's like doing life on our own, left to our own devices, in our own pride, sin, shame, rebellion, anxiety, depression, and Jesus brought transformation, and so it moves us with compassion and hope that other people would have the same opportunity. Unreached means people do not have access to the gospel. They can't even hear the gospel because there aren't people around them who even know the gospel. Unreached people, unreached places are where Jesus is largely unknown and the church is unable to bring that hope, to make Jesus known without outside help. Three billion unreached people in our world means that 40% of the world population is on the road to never having an opportunity to hear the name of Jesus even once. Did you know that? 
I didn't. Start digging into these statistics and thinking, wow, God. If you're a person who cares about equity, if you're a person who cares about justice, if you're a person who cares about things being just and right, this has to move you, especially if you're a follower of Jesus. Jesus made abundantly clear he wanted equal opportunity access to the gospel all across the world for every tribe, tongue, nation, and language. If you are a justice, equity person, this has to move your heart. It's wrong. It should bother you. I got these stats here represented visually. The world population is approximately 7.9 billion people right now in over 17,000 people groups. Unreached people are over 3 billion. It's actually 3.36 people in over 7,000 people groups. That represents 42% of the world population that is unreached. If you look around the room, that would be about half of this room that you're in right now. Now, the two main things needed, and this is where... (laughs) A heartbreaking reality gets even worse, so brace yourself. The two things needed to change this dynamic would be people and dollars, right? Well, if there's no people around that can tell them the hope of Jesus, then send people. And if it takes money to send people, then send dollars. That, that's what it would take. Now, to be clear, when we're talking about sending people, this is not sending the great white tan hope from North America to kind of come and save the day. This is about sending people in culturally appropriate and culturally sensitive ways where they go in to work with and empower local indigenous leadership to be the expressions of the gospel within their unique cultural framework and identity, all right? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about saying people. We've got a bunch more thoughts on that that you could look at in our missions and generosity fluency. But, but when it comes to the problem, the dilemma, the heartbreaking dynamic of 40% of our world unreached, it's dollars and people. Let's talk people. Right now, in our modern world, the number of missionaries working among unreached people groups is approximately 3%. The harvest is plentiful. Jesus said the laborers are few. Jesus knew, like 3%. So of all the missionaries that we send all over the world, we send 3% of missionaries out of the 100% of missionaries. We send 3% to unreached people groups. Well, that's not good. What about dollars? When it comes to the percentage of missions giving of the global church that goes to unreached people groups, that is approximately 1%. Are we seeing the problem here? 40% of the world without even an opportunity to hear the gospel and respond, right? That's just dignity. That's just access. That's that's just giving someone the honor of choice and opportunity. And 40% of the global world without access to the gospel, completely unreached. And to solve this heartbreaking dilemma from King Rabbi Jesus, who clearly said, go and make sure the gospel goes to all the nations, to the whole world. Our solution at this present moment is we send 3% of our people and 1% of our money. Somebody say, Lord, we repent. Or no one say it. That's cool. You don't have to say it. Do you feel this? I feel this. Practically, unless something changes, this problem will not be remedied. It means three billion people will be born, they will live. They will die without having the opportunity to hear the good news of the message of Jesus even one time. And to do anything to address this tragedy, we are sending 3% of our people and 1% of our dollars. And I think it breaks God's heart. Everyone take a breath. I know oftentimes stats and big thoughts are hard to grapple with, so let me bring this into a human story. Imagine you have a family. You all do. And imagine that your mom gets diagnosed with a terminal but treatable disease, but it's expensive. Dad makes good money. Two adult kids, they can work and they have an income. And so they all come together and they say, listen, guys, we love our mom so much. We got to do something about this. But they really, really love Disney. Maybe that's your thing. More power to you. I don't understand standing in line and sweating 
my entire life out to get dehydrated for $7,000 in your firstborn child, but more power to you. They love Disney and they're like, okay, we gotta do something about mom, but they got the Disney thing and they got the Disney passes and they go on the excursions and they got all this stuff. And, and, and at the end of the day, what they have freed up and allocated of their unspent resources for their terminally ill mother is 1% of their income. We would look at that family and say, y'all are messed up. How much do you have to hate your mom to do that? Right? We would be looking. We would all say, whoa, like we got to have some family counseling, right? Like we got to dig into some issues there. We would realize if they continue in this trajectory, the outcome for their mom is bleak, namely death. Friends, are you connecting the dots? This is the family of God right now. This is our family. 3% of people, 1% of dollars. And Greenhouse, as a church family, we are not okay with this. God's not okay with this. We're committed. We are actively and continuing to up actively our people and our dollars to sending people and money to the unreached. Amen? Now, let me pause for a second here because I realize we're in mixed spiritual company and maybe you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus or you're investigating God, faith, and spirituality and we're thrilled that you're here, by the way. You're like, well, man, I did not know what I was signing up for. It's fine. Some things in life need to be addressed because they matter. And I can understand if you're like, okay, pastor, I, I appreciate the caveat about sending people in culturally sensitive ways, but are, are we advocating that the solution to global inequities is to go and be ambassadors of American culture and Western religion? No, not what I'm saying. In fact, the way of Jesus is not a Western way. You guys know this, right? Like Jesus was not American. Are we all like, I know, you broke my heart. It's, I'm sorry, it's just history. Jesus was not American. Jesus was a Jew from the Middle East. This is an Eastern religion that has come and pervaded Western culture. You guys tracking with this? In fact, where we see the gospel flourish in the most organic way, it's Eastern peoples who realize, oh, I'm tracking with all this stuff. And us Western people are like, well, I don't get it. I don't understand. Like wh what I'm saying well, I'll put it this way. I, I worked for a charity foundation in, before this, and, and we were responsible for going around as a foundation to, to different communities throughout the world and finding needs and, and figuring out partners that were on the ground working to address those needs in regard to human rights issues and, and poverty and things of that nature. And so everywhere that I went, there were the usual suspects all across the globe. Like, you would find Oxfam everywhere. You would find UNICEF everywhere. You would find the Swiss everywhere. Like between their chocolate and their humanitarian aid, the Swiss were just everywhere. Like anywhere I went, I'm like, the Swiss, why, what are they doing? I don't know. They're, they're, it's always there. And, and they were there. You're like, are, are you saying they're there because they think they're better? I don't, I don't know, but I don't think so. They're there because they're realizing there are human problems that exist here. Often they were there to deal with poverty and, and malnutrition. They were often there to deal with disease and disease prevention and malaria medication. They were there because they realized there are problems that affect all humans. And when you find a problem that affects all humans, it requires all humans to care for all humans. It's global compassion. Now, now track with me this idea. This is something we already get. None of us would be like, what in the world are they doing there trying to help stop malaria in Kenya? We'd be like, amen, I'm glad of that. They should do more, right? We would say that's a good thing to do. Now track with me, if you believe, and, and maybe you don't, but if you believe as a follower of Jesus that there is a global disease called sin affecting all humans, then it is incumbent on us as humans to do everything possible to bring about the flourishing and the thriving of all human beings. You guys tracking? This is what it means to share the good news or the gospel of Jesus. Now, if you say, John, I, I don't believe in that. I actually don't think that's the case. Okay, that's fine. But, but track with me, if you, if you did, imagine for a moment, if you did like we do, the only solution is to share. In fact, if you don't share, that would be the least loving thing that you could do. That would be like letting mom with a terminal disease die. How heartless would you have to be if you really believe that and do nothing to alleviate the pain and suffering in someone's soul and the spiritual destiny that awaits them? 
the only loving thing to do would be to share. Matthew 24 in the text, Jesus says, there's going to all, be all these things that happen as we come to the end of the age. And this gospel of the kingdom, he says, will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Souls, eternity, destiny. I get that we're talking about heavy matters right now. It's weighty. So I think the natural question is, John, pastor, reverend, are you sure this is something we're supposed to do? Like, Jesus is the savior of the world. Jesus is the hero. Jesus is the one who saved the day. Like, are you sure this is something that we're supposed to do? Or, or is this just something, I thought this is what he does. Like, he, he's the savior, dude. I thought this is what he does. Well, it's a fair question. Are we interpreting this correctly? Let's look at the response of the early church and these first disciples. When you look at the first disciples, 11 of the 12 scattered around the world making disciples of different people groups. 11 of the 12. Now, clearly, they, they, were, they were all Jewish individuals. They clearly would have been more effective in their known cultural context, but they did not stay in their known cultural context. Anybody have a guess as to why? Because Jesus told them to go. He said, go and make disciples in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and what? To the ends of the earth. Guess what they did? Exactly that. You look at the Apostle Paul, same thing. Paul would say things like, you know, I was here and I was over in Corinth, and, but there was no place left for me to preach, so I moved on. Well, there actually was literally places for him to preach. What he was saying is, we've got some churches and believers here, so they have an opportunity to not be unreached anymore. If they want to respond, they now have the dignity of choice. I got to move on to places where the gospel has not yet been heard by people. What Jesus is saying is that this gospel, this, by the way, this word gospel, it just means good news. The good news of the, the way of Jesus, the flourishing that God intended is available in your life right now. He says this gospel, this good news has to be preached everywhere. Are there lost people? Are there people that do not yet know Jesus stumbling in the darkness and sin like all of us have been in South Florida? Yes. Are there lost people in Nova, at FAU, at BC, at FIU? Somebody say yes. There's lost people at your job. Yes. And while it is important for us to not neglect the soul health of those around us, the point of Jesus is that those furthest are the most neglected. We can't forget. Jesus promises he's returning and we get to go home with him. And the call is to bring as many people from as many nations as possible. When it comes to Jesus' return in Matthew 24, when it comes to having a love for our rabbi, for our teacher, for our Lord Jesus and the things that he loved and that move his heart, there's only one thing left to do and it's the one thing we can do, the good news of the gospel to the nations. Earthquakes, I don't have influence over. Famines, I don't have influence over. Wars and rumors of wars, nope, not in my job description. But bringing the good news to the whole earth, that is something, church, we can do. That is within our power. I'm not saying it's the only thing that we do, right? Like, we're, we're going to take vacations. We're going to live life. We're going to watch the Miami Heat beat the New York Knicks. Sorry for whoever said that, but we know where God's will lies. Like, we're, we're going to watch these things happen. We're going to enjoy sports. We're going to enjoy life. We're going to enjoy our kids. But I'm saying at some point, in the center of it all, if we're disciples, and if you're not, totally cool, no pressure. But if we are, we've got to be moved by the vision and the heart of our rabbi Jesus who says, you've got to bring this message to the whole world because they got to know it. It's our call. It's his heart. There's only one thing left to do, and it's the one thing we can do, the gospel to the nations. You said, all right, John, you're sweating up there. It's great. You seem really into it. What are we supposed to do with this? Like, what is the tangible? Because we don't live in... North Africa. We don't live in the Middle East. We live in South Florida. We live in, like, what, what are we supposed to do? Here, here's four things I'd love for us to start doing this week. That was three. Four things I'd like for us to start doing. Counting is fun. This week, just making sure you're paying attention. First one is pray. First one is pray. There's a QR code up here on the screen. It takes you to a website that gives you specific prayer points and information for unreached people groups right now. The first thing we can do is pray. 
Every single time I've gotten to be in a context where there are people groups there or around that are unreached, the number one request is, can you please, pastor, can you please ask your church to pray more for us? When there's persecution, when there's hardship, when there's discouragement. I mean, come on, we get discouraged when our coworkers don't want to listen, let alone if nobody, if there's no community around. Number one is pray. Number two is give. We've got some incredible missions partners. One of the organizations you hear us talk about, Live Dead, they're committed to going and planting the gospel in places where it has not yet been planted and flourished. If you only knew the impact that your dollars have overseas, you would give more. I'm telling you, you would. It is incredible, the stories that we hear of life change and transformation, of angelic visitations and people having wild encounters with Jesus. God's heart is for the world. Number two, you can give. There's a QR code up on the screen. You can, before you leave, if you're like, man, I want to do something. I, I'm not going to go right now, but I want to do something. Any, you can mark unreached in an offering envelope and drop it out there. You can scan the QR code. There's a drop down thing called unreached. 100% of your dollars will go to work, gospel work amongst unreached people groups. It'll hit the ground this month, next month, because that's, you know, it's the 30th, but drag it with me. Number three is disciple. Disciple. Maybe you personally are not called to go. Maybe you're exactly where God wants you to be or exactly where he wants you to be right now. But the call is as you are going to make disciples. And so while you're here, if you are engaged in the call of Jesus and the mission of God, making disciples, maybe you're not personally called to go, but someone that you're gonna disciple to hear God's voice and follow his lead and step out in love for Jesus is called to go. And as a result of your discipleship and influence in their life, they will say yes to Jesus and go to the nations. Number three is disciple. Not everyone will go, but some will go. Number four is go. Maybe you're here and you are called to go. Maybe you're here and it's been a dream in your heart for a long time or a long time ago. Maybe you even let it drown out or die, but you know you're called to not be here in your known cultural context where everything is familiar. You know you're called to go. If that is you, Man, come talk to me afterwards. Talk to Michelle afterwards. We've got resources. We'd like to talk with you. We'd like to join you in prayer to help you obey Jesus. Maybe you're called to go. Maybe you're called to go to Guyana. Maybe you're called to go to the 1040 window. Maybe you're called to go to the Arab world. Uh, agree. I'd love for us all agreeing as a church family. We are praying as a family of churches throughout the state of Florida that God would move amongst our heart to address this significant need and we would be able to send 100 missionaries out to bring soul flourishing and thriving for the glory of Jesus and the benefit of people. We're a people of longing. We love Jesus. He's changed our life. He's saved our life. We love him so much. And if you long for his return, there's only one thing left to do and it's the one thing we can do, the gospel to all the nations. David Platt says, there's a person who lives zealously for the spread of the gospel to the nations, but isn't a missionary. This person is called a follower of Jesus. I remember my wife and I had an opportunity shortly after we got married to lead a missions team, a short-term team to India. And I grew up here in South Florida, and so Latin food always had the throne to my heart. Like, it was the unparalleled, you know, and then I went over to India. Any, any Indian food lovers? Like, how anybody like Indian food? I mean, amazing. So Indian food here is good. If you get it home cooked, it's, like, really good. But Indian food in India, whoo, I thought I, like, died and went to heaven. Once for the spice, but everything else for the flavor. It was amazing. And I was over there in India, true story, another story for another day. But I was over there in India and, and man, I met some of my faith heroes, Nancy and I to this day, some of our heroes of the faith were over there and we just fell in love with the people and the hospitality and the culture and it was so amazing. And, and so we got to go and we worked uh, amongst a people group that was very oppressed socioeconomically, they were oppressed politically. And so they said, hey, John, you're going to have an opportunity to preach a sermon to some of these very persecuted believers who have been told within their cultural framework that God wants nothing to do with them, that God didn't even create them. They just happened to exist and they've been treated like literal trash their entire lives. And now they have responded to the gospel of Jesus, which by the way, if you're like, well, how are we going to mess with culture? We all connect with the fact that there are some amazing parts of every culture and some parts that must die at the foot of Jesus. You guys know human trafficking is a part of some cultures, right? 
How many of you would say like, human trafficking is wrong. Well, why would you say that? Because you're pointing to an empirical standard that's not the culture itself. That's a whole nother sermon. So they realized, man, they were, they were loved by God. And they said, John, you're gonna get a chance to preach a sermon to this, to this little group of believers. And I was, I was so pumped. Like I poured my guts out into this sermon prep. I was so ready. It, it truly felt like an honor to get to communicate to these believers. And so, so we're getting ready to go and, and, and we're in the vans and we're going. I got my sermon ready. And, and the, our host who was there with us, the Indian guy, he picks up the phone. He, he says a few things. I don't know what it was because it wasn't in English. And he turns back and says, okay, change of plans, Sean. I was like, okay. He said, actually, in, in this community, we don't get many villagers, especially villager, or many visitors, especially visitors of your, I was like, white people. He's like, yes. Great, lack of melanin, got it. He said, so the entire village has gathered to hear you speak. It's like, okay. He said, so I need you to change your sermon. Uh, 90 plus percent of these people in this village have never heard the gospel one time. I was like, okay, when do we get there? He's like, seven minutes, go. <laughs> it was the most passionate sermon prep I have ever done in my life. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, all right, Lord. And obviously I didn't have much time to change anything. So you're just trusting in the Holy Spirit at that point. You're like, all right, Lord. And so we get out of the vans and we're, and we're there. And sure enough, the whole village is gathered around and they're just listening. And I open my mouth. And to this day, it might've been one of the most anointed sermons I've ever preached with 6.4 minutes of sermon prep. And it was probably one of the most filled with the spirit moments I've ever had in my life. It was probably one of the moments where the love of God felt the most tangible to me and through me I've ever experienced in my life. It was probably one of the greatest moments of boldness in the midst of a cultural context that I knew nothing about that I've ever experienced in my life to date. Why? Because God loves the world. Like I, I, I preach this with passion because I felt it in real life. Like I have experienced the heart of God for people who have been taught entire life that, that God wants nothing to do with them, that God doesn't care about them, that God didn't even create them, that there's no value or worth or dignity. And I felt the heart of God coming out of my frame saying, John, you got to tell them that God so loved the world. And friends, I've got, I get so distracted and it's so easy to get caught up in real life, legitimate challenges and problems and work and, and family and drama and friends and kids and career and all the stuff that can consume our attention. I totally get it. And yet we hear our rabbi Jesus saying, go make disciples baptize, teach them to obey of all nations, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Friend, God loves you so much. And if you're in Guyana, if you're watching online, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you're like, why are you so intensely compelled with this thought? Because God loves you so much. You're like, yeah, I've heard that before. No, 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 you don't understand. He proved it. The proof is in the sacrifice that Jesus made. The proof is in the punishment that he willingly took on. The proof is in the cross that he bore. The proof is in the scorn that he endured. The proof is the shame that was put on him that we deserved, not him. The proof is that he allowed himself to die and be buried and he rose again from the dead. The proof is in the fact that you are listening to my voice right now and you still have breath in your lungs because he loves you so much. He's been knocking on the door of your heart wanting you to know that he's near and he cares and he loves you and our response to his knocking is we say yes. We change our minds. Repentance. It's this liberating reality where you give up. You surrender. You say, I am so tired of trying to figure this out on my own. I give up. I surrender. God, if you love me as much as everyone here tells me you do, you got me. He stands at the door and knocks because he longs for you. Like what, what sort of a mind-bending reality is it 
that the God of the universe and the creator of the cosmos longs for you to know he loves you. It's like, unlike any other religion, any other faith tradition on the planet. Maybe you're here today and, and you never repented. You've never changed your mind to say, Jesus, you're the Lord, you're the king, you're the one with the answers. I want to follow your lead. You need to do that today. I'm going to invite you to do that today. It's life. He's life. Some of you are here and you need to get your longing back. It's been a long time since you thought about being with him. It's been a long time since that love in your heart was stirred with passion. It's been a long time. Maybe you long to long, but it's not there right now. That's fine. He could take that. Ask him for it. Say, God, stir my heart with love and longing for you. Maybe you're in this room and you are called to the nations. Your heart is uniquely stirred in more than just an intellectual way. There is something like a fire shut up in your bones where you know, man, this is what God has made me for. We're going to close in just a moment. I'll encourage you to just find some space here at the altar and just give Jesus your yes. There will be lots of steps and lots of training and lots of process and lots of logistics to work through, but it starts with you saying, God, I hear you and I'm in. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. And we invite you right now in this moment, in this space, to stir our hearts. Lord, we want your heart, we want your eyes to see the world in the way that you see it. You can keep your head bowed and your eyes closed this is just for a moment of reflection and response. Maybe you're here and you need to respond to the amazing love of God and say yes. Maybe you're from a, a different religious tradition. Maybe you're from no religious tradition. Maybe you're from a different background. Maybe you've been thinking about wrestling with, considering this idea for a long time or a short time and something in your heart is telling you this is real, this is true. It is. He loves you. If that's you, wherever you're at, I just want you to shoot your hand up in the air and say, man, you're talking to me, John. John, you're talking to me. I sense God moving. Awesome. John, you're talking to me. You can put it right back down. And just give him your yes. Say, Jesus, I hear you knocking. I'm yours. I don't even fully know what that means yet, but I know I'm yours. I want to follow your lead. Help me, teach me, change me, guide me. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you're just taking this all in. It's like drinking from a fire hose, these global realities and and you long to long. In fact, you would love the heart of God for all nations, for the gospel preached to all peoples, to the whole world. Right there, why don't you ask him? Lord, give me your heart. Help me see this world the way you see it. Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. I love you. I want to love the things you love. I want to be moved by the things that move you. Make it your prayer. 